thing. Welcome to Vulgar Complexity 2, and it's me, Cedric Bard of Arm Blog, and Abby Hassan of Against the Law. Um, and we're talking about complexity and labor, um, particularly unionization, and um, we'll be talking about the way that uh, the development of labor oligarchies and the left as a separate kind of group that was associated with oligarchies. Like people as different as Adolf Reed and Richard Roydy. Um, yeah, your use of Roydy reminded me like why he was interesting because a lot of the stuff that I studied from him and uh, when I was in, a, in philosophy was not his interesting stuff. And he was just, you know, a milk toast bourgeois liberal um, who was both a pragmatist and super fucking complicated. Um, but you found a lot of his quotes from the late nineties where he's super prescient about, you know, what's going to happen to American politics, particularly when there's any sort of crisis at all, either economical or environmental. And now we've had both. Um, and I'll just quote what you quoted in a paper that you wrote. Uh, I don't know when you wrote it. When did you write the paper you sent me? Um, Basically last year. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the Reed quote was something that I expected. The Rorty quote was actually a little surprising. Um, so why Rorty Rye Weed is uh, something in a paper that you wrote last year. Uh, a smooth Harvard lawyer with impeccable do-good credentials and a vacuous to the repressive neoliberal liberal politics, has won a state Senate seat. His fundamentally bootstrap line was softened by a patina of the rhetoric of authentic community, the point where identity politics converges with old-fashioned middle-class reform in favoring form over substance. I suspect his ilk is a wave of the future in the U.S. black politics, and that is Adolf Reed in 1996, and he is uh, talking, I believe, about Barack Obama. Yeah, because he was in Chicago at the time, and he just happened across, you know, Obama's basically the launch of his political career and, and wrote about it, I believe, probably The Village Voice at that time. All of that was later compiled into a book of his uh, class notes. And so, yeah, just, just to give a little context about what, where you're coming from, you're, you're talking about two books I wrote this, this was actually a thesis for a master's degree, but the, the books are um, the Adolf Reed book, Class Notes, and a Richard Rorty book called Achieving Our Country, um, both kind of written in the late 90s um, about the kind of direction and trends and uh, currents in American politics. Um, yeah, and so, Rorty calls the, 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 the Trump part and what will happen with the American left part, too. Something will crack. The non-subordinate rhetoric will decide that the system has failed and start looking around for a strong man to vote for someone willing to assure them that once he is elected, the smug bureaucrats, the tricky lawyers, the overpaid bond salesmen, and the postmodern professors will no longer be calling the shots. People will wonder why there is so little resistance to his inevitable rise, where they will ask, was the American left? And then the American, uh, that's Richard Rorty in 1998. And of course the American left would like it did in the eighties come to exist in response to it. Um, for people who don't know, the first wave of DSA growth and the first wave of like the socialist movement was totally in response to Reagan in 82 to 84. Um, mm -hmm. So that had happened before. Um, so I think this is a, uh, these are interesting quotes. What I find interesting is there are predictable trends from a complexity standpoint, if you look at long-term trends towards oligarchy in these kinds of institutions and then deal with the decline of labor unions. One thing that I get a lot of pushback on is I don't think the hostility to labor unions was just neoliberal propaganda because I actually think it predates neoliberal propaganda. And currently in this lack of in this moment where labor unions are super popular, um, and there is labor militancy, the, the question remains, 
why don't people join the unions in their field most of the time unless they have to? Um, and the answer tends to be they like unions in general, and they know that being a unionized job is better being than a non-unionized one, but none of them like the leadership of the unions in the area where they actually work. Um, and again, looking at complexity trends, that's a predictable problem. That's something that people even foresaw as early as like the 1920s is becoming a problem before like labor had even really emerged as a as a or as an organized and formal force. So so yeah, I mean I think that, you know, this is a weird you know, this I, I this topic, I, I, I want to maybe try to pull it back a little bit. Um, yeah, let's pull it back because I think and, you and, and I are are coming at it from the same the, uh, theoretical frame, but but from different entry points into what we're talking about with it. Yeah, and and so I I, I, I appreciate um, that setting the political frame, but let's maybe pull it back and set the kind of conceptual frame for thinking mm-hmm. about organizing, right? Because I I. I I think it's going to be, you know, organizing can mean so many different things. It's one of, you know what I mean? It's like one of these, these, these words, like, I, I feel like, like there, there's a spectrum of what people mean when they say they're organizers or what organizing is, right? Like there's the kind of like, I, I, you know, I, I, you can say there's a spectrum from like party planning, like to party building, right? Mm-hmm. Where like at one end you could say organizing is just, planning an event right and i think a lot of like you, you know i don't I, I i think a lot of what organizing in the current kind of milieu is is that right like it's like planning a turnout event um and it and uh, what i want to kind of focus on or what i think is what's the relevant kind of organizing and in this broader context of you know, I'm going to try to bring in as much complexity language as possible because that's ostensibly the theme of this, right? But like, what, like, I feel like organizing is capacity building, right? Like, when I say organizing, I, it's definitely in that kind of like, I, I you know, I would definitely like in the kind of McAlevey school or the the um, the the kind of CIO or IWW world, right, where Organizing means um, moving people forward in their capacity to create collective power, right? right. Um, and it's and I, you know, I so and organizing that I'm interested in is and that I was trained in. I was a union organizer for several years with one of the kind of you know no, like known kind of organ like actually organizing unions that actually grows and gets new members and stuff um and you know i was definitely trained in that kind of mode of organizing of of identifying leaders and um and one-on-one conversations and you know like pretty intense uh you know you know and definitely one of those kind of places where like some some there's been problems right like the pink sheeting and all that kind of stuff has is something i've you know i've i've heard about for sure um but you know that's to me that's kind of like one of the big challenges right like and and getting a grasp on what it means to organize and understanding the like again from a from a systems perspective like what does it mean to organize and how much capacity, like how do we build these capacities to do it? And to me, these are the big questions because it's like, you know, um, you have, you know, when we're thinking about political groups, I know that you cover the kind of sectarian left and you talk about, um, you talk about these things a lot. Right. And, and, and you talk about labor a lot. And so, you know, I think there's some real kind of material capacity problems that need to be figured out, right? Like in terms of what it takes to organize a 
institute or an organization what like in this kind of cult to movement spectrum right right <laughs> um so i i know this seems a long way away from uh maybe from the rorty reed conversation but um i think that that if we if we dive into it we we can pull together the threads that that frame this because what i'm talking what i'm trying to figure out and what I'm kind of proposing in, in the paper I wrote, at least that, that you read, is about um, trying to conceptualize a, a model of organizing and then try to figure out what its limits are. Right. And I come at it from a different perspective in the way that I look at systems and see where systems create uh, capture points because of kinds of a complexity and misalignment. So for example, why is professional, you know, you've been a professional organizer. I am an unprofessional organizer, meaning that I'm a, like, I'm a union rep, um, but I'm not on the paid back end. Uh, I have spies on the paid back end, um, which you, which I seriously, you need. You absolutely um, need. <laughs> like, um, you know, I have by spies, I mean friends, but I'll have, I'll have lunch with people who work on the, the profession, the, the lower end of the professional side. Um, and then you have a lot of figures like, like union presidents who are nominally rank and file, but the moment they take the position, they actually drop to like halftime at their job. Cause you have to like, like. Yeah. You, you are actually like in you're like half employed by the union, half employed by your old school in the case of what we do. Um, and I've been studying since the 1980s unions over reliance on investment and land trust, um, which is something I've known about for a long time and talked about for a long time. It's finally getting talked about in organizing circles because of a report that came out last year by uh yeah, radish research that uh, in these times gotten, and then finally Jack even started talking about it. Thank God, but it's like something that Bill Bradley was talking about when I was four years old. Mm -hmm. um, now, what is interesting about that is like it becoming the majority of union like financial uh, backing is relatively new. But that's why unions don't seem to care about organizing stable resource bases anymore. They're like, and they're just trying to chase any source of dues, including a bunch of transitory workers, like TAs, like baristas, and stuff like that. Not that those people don't need representation, and not that it's bad that they're getting it. That I think people also misunderstand when I make that critique that I'm saying, oh. You know, oh, you're just shitting on the baristas. No, they need representation. It's just baristas don't tend to do the job for more than five years. A TA legally can't do the job for more than six. Like, and there's kinds of limits in organizing automatically built into that that people just aren't looking at. So that's how I came to this. Mm -hmm. And so, so what's interesting about this is you're you're looking at this uh, a complexity from a systems building organizing capacity and i'm looking at from a where are we going to have problems when we build the system it's going to lead to like capture going to invoke a tendency towards oligarchy going to turn your constituency against you or demobilize it etc and the thing is they are intimately related but they you very rarely see people who deal with both ends of those things, because if you're organizing the build capacity in the way you defined it, you have to figure out how you invest your rank and file in the organization enough for it to both improve their lives in a real and immediate way. Like there are so many leftist or, you know, uh, organizations who promise life improvements, like, 5, 10, 100, 200, a millennium down the line. Um, yeah, I used to complain about this with the, ID, uh, with the IWW. I mean, I'd be like, well, the IWW is going to cost me, you know, uh, like 40, 50, 30 bucks a month. <laughs> yeah, you know, 30 bucks a month, you know, and 
my union at work is going to cost me 60 bucks a month. But my union at work, even if it blows donkey ass, is going to at least get me um, a lawyer, a rep to deal to help me deal with administration, um, someone to lobby for me, and at least three kinds of liability insurance that I probably can't afford on my own. And now, weirdly, my union doesn't even like talking about that because they're like, we want people to join for positive reasons. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I think having a fucking lawyer is a positive reason, but whatever. Um, but that's a weird, that's another debate. But because they'll tell me like, oh, talk about our benefits. Like you get magazine discounts. And I'm like, who cares? <laughs> like, <laughs> but, but in a real sense, they actually are still, we're disagreeing on tactics, but we're both agreeing that the positive immediate payback is part of the vision and why you get people in. And one of the things that you, one of the, the things that you have with a lot of unions and, and places like where I live is you have a lot of free riders. Um, and if you get rid of the free riders, you have another problem. So here, like, well, here's what I mean. So if you have a closed shop, which is fair, but it will make leadership unresponsive to membership because they're going to get it regardless. And if you have an open shop there, there is a, there's a lot of incentive for people to go like, well, the union's going to negotiate for me anyway. But uh, it's 70 bucks a month, and I don't see where I get enough immediate benefit to join. Like, and those are practical things. And that's just on like the labor immediate thing. Now, when we start dealing with, let's move from a bunch of weird cults to a clearinghouse of advocacy into an actual movement. Um, that's a that's a separate thing, but it's actually related because we're dealing with similar kinds of systems and perverse incentive sets and capture points. And capture points are where like somebody can be a bad actor, even if they don't mean to be, just because there's perverse incentives are are whatever. Like, um, you know, I think that's that's uh that's a key problem. And so when we talk about organizing for building capacity, one of the things we have to figure out, like, and I'm going to, this, I'm going to use cybernetics language, but I'm not going to use like the tendency of people who get into viable systems theory to just throw the numbers around. So like system five versus system one, but you need like both uh, organizing ethos are something to orient towards before you even build a program. Like a lot of Marxists want to immediately jump to like, we can program build like a minimum program, immediate demands. Uh, and then like a maximum orientation. And a lot of times I'm like, well, you need the orientation first. Like, uh, because what's your program actually built from? Who's it for? What's it coming out of, right? I mean, this is a really interesting point, right? Because I, I think this, so let's situate it, right? Like mm -hmm. when, we're, when we're talking about shop organizing, when we're talking about, so my organizing experience is in very much service sector, right? Like, like uh, hospitality industry, uh, you know, all, like all yeah, like one of one of the organized area of of the economy too. Like we should be very clear about that. Like service so, sectors, so like two point five percent represented by a union, like highly underrepresented. Yeah, and one of the places where you have this huge difference between between um, you know organized and unorganized wages and benefits, right? Right. But so so within like within that, and you have. Um, you know, managerial practices that are incentivized and rely on the disposability of labor, right? Oh yeah, um, the the, the, right? the tra transitionary labor thing that we were just talking about. Yeah, very different, pr very different. I'd say probably than your context of a professionalized, credentialized staff where you have a little high, you know, you have a higher barrier to entry and probably a higher. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I'll, you know, I don't. I, I think teachers quit more than they get fired. <laughs> Right. Oh, teachers. Um, never yeah, and like, like particularly right now, like you have to violate an ethics clause to get fired. Um, you might, you might piss off the wrong person and and get 
non-renewed and that 20 years ago when I started teaching that would end your career but now it really has no effect like it just means you're going to a different school so so I think that the, the, that we're talking about two different pr- pr- different contexts and that's gonna I think be really important when we Although think about for transitory actually kind of because one problem that we have in our unions is it's hard to get the, the the union leadership to invest in new staff because new staff doesn't tend to stay for more than three years. They leave in their own, but they leave. Mm-hmm. And yet, like if they don't join the union, the likelihood that they're going to only stay for three years goes up dramatically. So it's kind of a weird feedback loop. Gotcha. But, you know, so but but, you know, so when we're thinking about different the con- the context helps build what part what a huge core of the program kind of is right like when we're talking about low wage or otherwise low wage and um you know kind of um you know like you know i i i'd, I'd be curious to hear what you think the motivating kind of factors are for you you discuss some of them but like what i'm talking about like it's like i don't I want to be able, like, I want to raise, I want benefits. I want, like, I want to not, I want job security and that I want good cause, you know, for, you know, I want to, I, I want a contract that, that means that I'm not, I can't arbitrarily be fired. Right. Like, or have your hours reduced to nothing, which is another thing they do, which is a real right. dirty practice and services. Right. So basic, like very basic kind of material economic factors but like also like i want to be treated right like you know the 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 casualized um economic practices come along with um dignitary practices that are also like you know like disrespectful like people people who are paid poorly are treated poorly right like this is these things go together right and so like you know i don't want to say one causes the other but it's 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 oftentimes at least from my organizing experience it's a very like most people know the boss does not have their interests at heart and does not fundamentally respect them as a person and as an individual and it's it's you know the, the the process of organizing is really just building those conversations and and honestly a lot of it is convincing people that it is possible to win right <laughs> like mm-hmm. and that that collective action is the route towards that victory right um right. and you know i think that it's it's one of those things where there's the structure of the workplace and the economy kind of makes those things seem true i think that like in, in a lot of ways people just know that those things are true um and so you know, to me, like when, when you're talking about an ethos, I, I think that that in in a way, like service sector low wage organizing, the ethos is this kind of these like like you know the motivation is these kind of basic things, right? Yeah. It gets more complicated when we get into other context, and like the the to me the big question is what are the possibilities for organizing as we get out of that kind of um, bread and butter issues and baseline dignity? I mean, this is an interesting thing to talk about because teachers and nurses are an interesting analog. We, despite myths to the contrary, are not on the low end of the income spectrum. We are on the low end of the income spectrum for professionals. And for, like, for your educational staff. And for our right. educational staff, which is really what I mean by for professionals. Well, like it's yours a, particularly, but <laughs> right. they don't count probably the education you've done to yourself. No. <laughs> but, uh, but like, but the thing is, for example, like if you look at like, like Marxist academics in the media sphere, as a teacher, I actually make a lot more than most of them. It's what, it, what you discover in like podcasting world, for example, is like most left podcasters, even ones that are fairly famous, are making less than 50K a year. And then you'll meet somebody who's making 900,000, a million dollars a year. And there's like not hardly anything in between. Um, now, 
I, as a teacher, am going to pull between when I started around 40, now that I've been in for 15 years, you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year in most of the country. If I'm in the Northeast in New England town, I'm going to pull more, like I will pull six figures, but barely. Um, my my point about that though is then if you get paid decently, why does it suck so bad? Well, we don't get paid compared to inflation. Like we are actually losing purchasing power money every year. I mean, even when we get big raises like four or five percent. I've never in my life known teachers to actually outpace inflation. Mm-hmm. Like whatever their raises are is usually a little lower than it. Um, that was not true until the 1990s, uh, but also money values stabilized after the 1970s in a way that kind of tied it in. There's a whole lot of teacher raises from the 70s to the 90s, even though it was a very neoliberal period. And that's kind of hard to explain, but it was because of the cartelling and credentialing of the profession. Before the 1970s, like, you didn't have to have a degree to be a high school teacher in a fuck lot of states, which I don't think people know. Like, you just had to have, like, a high school diploma and some training classes. Like, mm. like the professionalization of teachers, um, particularly of teachers of color, because it used to be, for example... Uh, In the South, we used to have a bunch of teachers of color, and it's become recently that they weren't replaced. And it wasn't even because the schools couldn't wouldn't hire people of color, is that nobody with a degree who was a person of color wanted to be a fucking teacher. Um, So they had all these old teachers of color from the segregated period, and they were waved in because a lot of them were excellent teachers, um, but they literally learned their profession by doing it, and that they had like associates' degrees or or, you know, uh, most of them had associate's degrees, whereas now, like, to be fully qualified, you often have to have a master's, right? Mm-hmm. So you're looking at a difference between seven years in higher ed versus, like, two, which, and a lot of things to do with teaching, I actually, I mean, I know this is somewhat controversial, because uh, I don't really think you need a master's. One of the things that they talked about in the aughts a lot, and this was a fucking Bill Gates study um is that education levels didn't matter but they didn't look at what the education was in and in 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 education there's all this meritocratic credentialing it's the only thing that i know of other than healthcare, where even if you have the skills you're going to go have to go back and get a degree to to increase your job like you have to and that's not for the students that's for the bureaucracy that's developed around it right and and that has all kinds of additional cost and curtailing stuff. And there's all these capture points. Um, now, when you deal with something like service sector, which is harder to organize, it's harder to organize because if we're honest, think, Abby, you and I both know that organizations were built off of high density per, per shop models for factories, basically. Mm-hmm. Um and that it was to get over the prior craft unions would often have a sh- like like and they st- railroads are still like this, but like the the there'd be like the guild of lever poolers like and th- this was really how it was organized, and the guild of like um let's say uh, uh, forklift wielders. I used to do that. So, you know, um, and, and of course that means that you're actually competing for better contracts within the job site, which is awful. The IWW realized pretty early on industrial unionizing in general from CIO realized you needed to get everything together and like the entire factory and the IWW yeah. really thought in the entire class. Yeah. Uh, and this was based off of what we had seen in Europe, which was the unions built up capacity. They were mostly illegal. When they became legal, they got they got into some issues. And how they would manifest beyond that was to join together into what was effectively labor parties. And the labor parties would advocate for them. That's how both labor came out of the UK and how the Socialist Party came out in Germany 
was coalitions of unions. Um, in fact, you know, the predecessor to the SPD is the All German Labor League, which was a union of unions. Um, that because also it was it was Reich and Fall one, they didn't have like that much professionalization. The professionalization actually came in when they became a party. Um, so that's that's a very different thing. Um, Taft Hartley was passed in the United States to make sure that would never happen here. That even though it wasn't the Democrats who passed it and Truman vetoed it, whatever. I mean, Truman was not a friend of the worker at all, but uh, he, he did realize that that was bad for labor. But interestingly, you want to talk about like something that I, I didn't expect, but when I started studying this, one of the things that I discovered was bad for labor was the primary system. Mm -hmm. Like, because... Yeah, I mean, that, that, you know, in, in America, it, it never was as a, explicit a political project, right? I mean, we have this... Sorry, is that my child is screaming? It happens. <laughs> oh, my we God. We live in a world... Um, <laughs> But you know, we we had you know we had the American version of the European story you just told, right? Everything is amalgamated into one party or another in some you know kind of amorphous coalitional way um, that has no kind of explicit contours, right? <laughs> like right. it's the it's it's the backroom kind of deal, whatever, right? But that was the seat. That was the Labor Party, right? It was that implicit. Um, component of the Democratic Party, right? Like, um, I, well, okay. I, me and you might actually be different in this because I, I don't, I don't think the Democratic Party has ever been a labor party. I no, think la labor I, has I, been okay. There's some people who kind of in the DSA kind of think it, it's like a deformed one, and I'm like. No, it's no, it's never I, been a labor party. I, it's don't, a, I, mm -hmm. I don't honestly think that the word party translates across the pond, right? I mean, it's just like it, you know, it, it it's too. It, I don't know if the word party has the capacity to call the labor party and the Democratic Party the same thing, right? Like, like, well, yeah, just like, like if we're from a, like a system perspective, like. The Democratic Party might as well be one and the Republican Party zero, right? Like it's the two components of a system that's gamed out to have two parts, right? Like um, right. and 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 what's in those parts is a dynamic process. But like it's a dynamic process that plays out through kind of political entrepreneurialism coupled with like, you know, demographic changes and like economic, you know, it, it's it's. It, it changes yeah. with the kind of uh, What's with a lot of complex actually, factors. Michael Lind, not a not a guy whose politics I share, but I think his analysis this is actually correct. Was that from like the Jackson period, Andrew Jackson period, to the FDR period? Um, the Democratic Party was the parts of capitalist society that either. In America, they either predated it, like weird yeomans, planter class people, slavers, etc., or that were knocked out of it, like some belt industry, uh, parts of the labor coalition, um, black people. Uh, so, like the Democratic Party was like, yeah, was like the one, but the zero was that the Republicans were the party of big business. And at a certain point, I'd even say that's why they were the progressive force in American history. You know, like, mm -hmm. um, it, which I know people get weird remarks to say that, but I actually think like when you look at like I don't know big business versus slavers, I'm siding with big business. Um, well, you would have been a Republican in the right. 1860s, right? right. And, <laughs> you know, and like Marx wrote for a Republican newspaper, like yeah, like you know, in New York. Um, so and he wrote letters to Lincoln, right? The in the 1930s, this gets weird, but it also labor's interesting because the progressive populist movement, uh, the progressive movement was in both the Democratic and the Republican Party, but the populist movement only went into the Democratic Party for reasons of 
frankly, kind of religious wow. stuff around William Jennings Bryant. And like it, the sharecroppers were increasingly kind of left out of the whole white progressive capital coalition. And so it was, e- it was an easy sale for them. What, what I think Lind argues now, but the dynamics in the one and two is somewhere between the, the new left and now half of the Republican coalition and the democratic coalition swapped. Mm-hmm. So the petite bourgeois and the Sun Belt went over to the Republicans. Um, labor didn't go anywhere. It just got less and less activated and less and less able to manifest itself. That's what I was talking about with the primary system. It just, they, they, they weren't a, yes, labor people can mo- can like activate voters, but they can't play in the primaries the way they could uh, in the caucuses or the backroom deals. Their organization strategies don't help them as much. Um, and, well, they're just, and, and, and they're just not as, you know, they don't represent uh, as significant a uh, force in the economy, right? Yeah, I, I mean, mean, like since what? The high point of U.S. labor was 30% of the private economy in the 1950s. Um, it became 30% of the public economy in the 1970s. I think also people don't realize public sector unions were illegal until like the end of the 20th century. Um, so teachers and unions and all that, even though we think of them as like the union movement, they're late. And unfortunately, one of the big compromising factors for the union movement, and I, and I know you know this, but a lot of people don't, is that the largest unionized sector is the sectors none of us want to deal with. Um, and that's the police. Like the, the single most unionized sector of the U.S. economy is actually protective services, i.e. cops. Like they're even more. Yeah, because they're all I mean, but, but, you know, and, and that's one of those things where, like, if we look, you know, Again, like, well, where is their movement in labor, right? And that's not, <laughs> that, you know, that's not, I mean, there, is, there might be movement in that sector of labor, but it's not the kind of movement that I think me and you are, are, no, right, are right. hoping to see flourish, right? right. I mean, I mean, it's I, also, honestly. It's, yeah, it's, well, it, it puts the AFL-CIO in a bad place. Because well, a lot of the hand, cop unions aren't in the AFL-CIO, right? That's true. But, but some of them some are. are. Right. Um, the more progressive cop unions. Oh my God. I can't believe I said that <laughs> phrase. Uh, but, uh, but it, like that's, but the thing is like, even though most of the cop unions actually, you're right, are not in the AFL-CIO, uh, they don't want, like when people were demanding the AFL, so kick, kick the cop, the, the police unions out. And I'm like, they're never going to do that because even though most of them aren't in it, the ones that are, they're big, are some of the biggest unions. And so, like, what are they going to do? But it is a liability because the police unions, even more than the teachers unions and the nurses unions and the, quote, PMC unions, do not vote with the rest of labor. Teachers unions, it's like a, it's it's regional and it's kind of a coin flip even there. Um, uh, nurses unions tend to be pretty fucking radical, actually. Um but those unions are like their problem. And the other unions that they can never predict where they're going to vote are the fucking like guilds, like the electricians union, which is really a guild are, are the freelancers unions. You never know where they're going to go either. Cause they can go on either side, but because they're like, of the, they're like the air traffic controllers, right. <laughs> Be, but because of, because of like the decline of industrial unionizing and the fact that the service, this is to bring it back to what you were talking about. Service sector is really hard to unionize. I was trying to explain that to someone like we had 600, we had like 600 votes to add shops last year uh, to, to the union movement. Um, that's, that's a huge number, but you didn't see that. You did see some raw number growth, but you didn't see that much raw number grow Uh and then i'm like well look at why because 400 of those shops were just starbucks and that represented 30 to 60 people a pop um when you would get it when you would flip a factory 
particularly before the 1970s. Now it might be three, four hundred people a pop, but in the 1970s, it's two to three thousand people a pop. Yeah. That's a massive difference in in like density and efficacy right there. Right. And so the challenge of, of organizing the service sector is really is really difficult because the 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 immediate bread and butter needs are obvious, but the structural ways to get them that the union yeah. developed in the 20th century that were mostly based on industrial models are yeah. not obvious at all. Like, so let's dig it, let's dig into that, right? Because I think that that's really that's one aspect of the core question here, right? Mm-hmm. Like, which is, you know, so what, what, like, there's the obvious, there's that problem of, of just sheer size, but like, I, I think that that is indicative of, I mean, I, I, how do we characterize that? Right. Like there's the problem of, so getting back to, to like this fundamental idea of organizing, right? Like mm-hmm. the the project of organizing is, and as I'm trying to articulate it, is um, a conversational process of developing basically like a shared language of power, right? Like, mm-hmm. and and that is that is like this is where the philosophy kind of comes in, right? Like that's like, an, that's a hermeneutic process that happens like intersubjectively, right? That's a process. Between, Let's define like, all those terms for normies, but you, you can finish, <laughs> finish your, your, your thing. No, I mean, I, I, I don't need to talk like that. The, the point is it's a process where that involves conversation between people to develop a shared understanding of their context and their power analysis and mm-hmm. their expectations and their road toward and their path towards um towards you know building power towards towards victory or whatever right mm-hmm. like so it's 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 an intense kind of conversational process right um and in the context of a shared workplace of 3000 people those conversations can metastasize into a movement much easy much more easily as as you're kind of saying because that shared context is so so shared right that those con- those conversations once they get started um can catch fire right mm-hmm. totally. as opposed to the more atomized workplace and the more atomized society that requires just from a material perspective requires more input more throughput basically right it requires more computation (laughs) of this power building process right because because you have to reconcile so many conflicting and different contextual dynamics right um and so like i mean I don't know, you know, that that to me is the problem, right? Like that is, is kind of flowing through all of these things. Like if we're talking about the, the different types of workplaces, but also the different type of society, we don't have a tradition currently of of membership, of of social of in, of social institutional participation that right. was a backdrop a hundred years ago to everyone's life, right? Even, yeah. I know you cover, you talk about churches a lot, right? Churches yeah, are the churches. last remnant and they're dying. <laughs> yeah. Well, pe- this is the thing people always put up, always come at me about that. Like, uh, I had uh, Jason Miles come on my show and he was like, well, but there are mega churches. I'm like, but mega churches is actually a sign of this. It's actually a sign of secularization. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, why do churches need to be that efficient? Why does WWE need to merge with a church to make people come? It's because people know WWE. They don't know like just the the routine and the ritual of 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 habitual com- communality, right? Right, like, and like like also a mega church is is cheaper to run. Like like just a, you're like oh it's huge. Like yeah, but like even it's a, even if it's a stadium, it's one stadium versus like it's the war scale. system. Of like the Mormon Church in Utah is incredibly expensive to maintain. 
right? Mm -hmm. Like, and they still maintain block churches and whatnot. And it actually does have certain social ameliorative effects. People oh, from sure. other classes know each other here in ways they don't in other parts of the country. Although it is because a lot less of us are Mormon, like myself, not a Mormon. Uh, you know, it, and I'm not saying this like saying the praises of Mormonism. I think Mormonism is a reactionary weirdo religion, but there are. I should probably be I think it's a very that. American religion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Mormonism is a quintessentially American, American. right? And, and oh yeah, and one that I think is actually like American experience was kind of progressive and interesting and even flirted with communism in the beginning and a super reactionary now. Um, well, the, isn't their logo a beehive, right? Like well, that's yes. Part of yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, and, and they were explicitly for common property and stuff. It, now, like many neoliberal things that like, they'll do welfare if you're one of them. Um, but that you know, my my point about that though is just like even the Mormons are having trouble maintaining this, and that's the second richest religious organization on earth because they actually enforce tithing. You mm -hmm. have to give ten percent of your net. Is it net? No, it's gross. You have to get ten percent of your gross income to the LDS Church, uh, wow. and in exchange for that, they'll make sure if you're poor, you always have stuff. But like. That's why they're so damn rich. No, I mean, nobody else is like that. Um, yeah. But even they can't maintain their systems are getting frayed and fractured. Um, so, you know, I've had Anton Yeager on, but like the thing that people don't think about, how many people are in the Masons or the Shriners or any of that stuff, uh, any of the charity groups, like, like, the, the fucking Masons advertise now. <laughs> it's a yeah. secret society. It's like, find someone you know and ask if you can join. We're really desperate. Um, like, like, you know, that's, that's what's happened to these social institutions. Um, and, and a lot of the things that seem like they're signs of growth actually are signs of trouble. Like I said, mega churches are actually a sign of a decline of the capacity both socially and also like actual in terms of like tithing and shit because th they need these mass big things to be efficient enough to get enough plate money in to maintain themselves. And if you don't believe me, like, like I used to live in a place that was just full of half empty churches, like making Georgia's like, yeah, you know, I've been like, there. <laughs> yeah, tons of half empty churches. Um and you know, yeah, 70% of the US is not uh, what 75% of the US is nominally religious religious, like 69% or something like that's Christian. Um you know, like the remaining religions are like six percent. Uh but that aside, um what is really telling is how many Christians still go to church and it's like one in four. Right. So while yes, nominally we have 75% uh, uh, of society is nominally religious. And like most of that, the overwhelming majority of that is nominally Christian. Only one fourth of that Christian group actually goes yeah. to church and pays tithes and, and, and it's so it's so interesting to me because I lived in South Korea for many years, which is only 33 percent Christian, but is more Christian on Sunday than the United States, because all that 33 percent Christian. They Go all are church. churchgoers. They all pay tithes. They're all very fucking serious about it. And and so it actually feels like more than here, mm -hmm. you know, Um. Look at them. It's not to say that we're like Western Europe, but I think we're closer to it than most Americans even realize. Like, so. yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know the. You know, I, I guess I don't have a, a good sense. I mean, Western Europe is pretty diverse too in terms of um, just cultural practices, obviously. But right. you know, I, I, like it, it's one of those. It's it's one of those things where I think. Um, 
I, this is like the this is like one of the big problems I'm really trying to get uh, understanding of, right? Because it's it's like I I came out of this organizing tradition that I think is effective in its place, right? And then I got into political organizing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, in like, uh, I mean, I'm currently, I mean, I'm not, I'm kind of a paper DSA member at this point. You I'm not and particularly active. like nine tenths of the DSA, but go on. Yeah, but you know, yeah, no, I mean, I was pretty active in DSA a few years ago. Um, and like, and, and I've been witness and party to many, many different political organizations, right? Like throughout my kind of, I, I spent a lot of time doing kind of activist lawyering. Um, so, you know, this question of organizing, like, you know, I, I think that there's a kind of, there's a, there's a organize, like the people who come out of labor, especially the sector of labor that is like, you know, really out mixing it up and winning, winning fights, right? Um, well, we can go and we need to just organize. We just need to organize. But outside that, you know, outside that context of the workplace and the like clear kind of, you know, I mean, it, the, the clear, uh, the, uh, the, just the, the, the ability to clearly delineate one side and the other, right, <laughs> in a mm -hmm. labor context. Um, I don't, you know, I'm, I just don't know what the like avenues of actually organizing, um, like powerful, like, or organizations or like anything akin to like the kind of what I, you know, what people aspire to historically, like, I just, you know, I, I, I it just, it just, I mean, what are the like, what are the new modalities and, and ways of, of, of organizing that can achieve that, right? And like, I, I don't know, I just had some interesting conversations recently with tech organizers who are doing, who are doing work organizing at like all remote workplaces, right? And mm -hmm. I think that, to, you know, they're having real organizing conversations and like, moving people through their kind of ideological barriers and like, you know, dealing with those issues of like people, you know, especially now where the tech sector is, isn't the kind of job that it was even two years ago, right? Where you could just, uh, if you're a programmer, you kind of were, you know, the top worker, but now it's like layoffs, layoffs, right? And people, you know, but the, the conversation of that you're a worker, that you like your interests lie with the other workers, not with the boss, is you know those are just perpetual conversations that that have to be had but like you know the process like i i mean what are the consequences of losing so much shared context is is to me the big question no it's huge i mean this to me is one of the first things that we have to be honest about like one of the reasons why we can't create a social subject right uh, something to plug into our systems in a real coherent sense is self-perpetuating. I mean, the reason why the working class is what you organize in Marxism has nothing to do with the fact the working class is victimized. I mean, oh, well, nothing is an overstatement, but very little. But uh, victimized is not the relationship that is key. Right. It, it's like the reason why they might want to overthrow society is that they're victimized, but that's not the key thing. The key thing is, historically... They could reproduce shit if they shared their knowledge with each other. They knew how to do it. Um, now, I guess one of the biggest pushbacks to Marxism that isn't talked about anymore is the complicatedness of society. And one of the things is like, well, any cook could have governed in the 19th century, but uh, we have nuclear reactors now. And so you still need some kind of professional and managerial strata of society and how do you inculcate them? How do you deal with that? Uh, like a whole lot of people don't seem to realize that if you socialize everything and then paid, paid the professionals for their added value, you recapitulate class society almost immediately. Like, uh -huh. and, and so much that they can store wealth and stuff like that. Like that you just, you, you don't actually achieve anything. Um, I, I guess you, you, the achievement could be that you have a state capitalism that is more responsive to democratic inputs. If it's actually responsive to democratic inputs, 
And what we discovered is most states actually aren't. One of the ironies of democratic inputs is actually the more you democratize things over time, the more oligarchical those systems tend to be unless the democracy is direct and mandated. Like, not only is it direct, but you have to participate. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, you know, th- th- that's, I mean, that's a whole, I, I, I would, <laughs> democracy is another one of these words. That I... <laughs> right, but exactly. It's like, what right. does it even fucking mean the, now? But... The more we use the word, the less actual, like, like the less actual input any particular person in the demos has right but but <laughs> well but, yeah but, yeah that's also true particularly in these massive states because it becomes matters of power law like well, yeah I, I mean but look if if we made like uh, this is a tangent but I, I i know you're not immune to tangents here um like like if we maintained the same stat like the same ratio of population to representatives in the house of representatives at the founding of the constitution we'd have like somewhere between five and ten thousand people in that body and and we i would argue we'd be be... what go go ahead I, I, I just, we'd, we'd be able to just become a direct democracy. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a lot closer to what you'd call a democracy. And this was a system that was explicitly not a democracy, right? Right. <laughs> but, but, but let's go back to that point that you said about grappling with, with, with the complexification of society, right? Because that is also kind of the class formation problem, right? Like mm. that it's like, that it's like, it's the comp of, it's it's the it's the lack of coherent structure of the working class in all of these ways we just talked about that make the ability to form class consciousness that, to form a party to form what you know to basically to to spark a movement i don't know what you know i think those are all kind of the same process almost right but like like it, it you know that it, that is part of what we're talking about. I think, right? That it's like, I mean, I, I don't. You, I, I'm not nearly as cognizant in, in, in Marxism as you, and so I, I'm definitely curious to hear like your perspective. But like, like I, I feel like that if if we if if the you know it's not a given. We're not dealing with a, a population here of people coming off the farm into the factory with sh- or coming off of a boat into the fa- into the cities like with 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 a large amount of shared context in like a new place we're an older country we're dealing with like you know even at, at like a level of just at, at every level we're dealing with a much more specialized individualized atomized system than that picture of kind of 19th century industrializing capitalism. So there's a couple of things going on with that as far as Marxism. The reason why I supplement complexity theory back into Marxism, A, I think Marxist dialectics indicates something like it anyway. Um, I I agree. um, B, uh, which is not to say they're the same thing, and I, I actually would argue that like, some things you need from Marxist dialectics is not in complexity theory, but there's also some things in complexity theory that aren't in Hegelian or Marxist dialectics. Um, for example, really dealing with multiple inputs that are contradictory and all of them are contradictory. Now there's like two sides, like 50. Um, but the the other thing that you you have to deal with is a lot of the notions of efficiency and physics in Marxism that Marx was explicitly pulling from are very early. So there's a whole lot of talk about how like capitalism is efficient in production, but it's chaos and everything else uh, and efficient in production in that it produces a lot of shit. doesn't produce even a lot of shit you need. You just produces a lot of shit period to generate abstract capital. And that's a kind of efficiency It's not one, it's one that like burns through resources and tends towards both weirdly, both monopolization and animization at the same time, which seems like a contradiction, but it's like, to me, that's clear. Like, Mm -hmm. like the way, like fewer, few corporations make everything yet. Also few and few of us work together. Like, um, the, 
the systems part of it though is that I think in Marxism there's not a tendency to look at what kind of things you need uh explicitly other than the revolutionary subject itself to deal with this problem and the understanding of the revolutionary subject that Marxists have yes there's a moral component to it and that moral component is like yeah the, the workers are being exploited the argument for exploitation is not moral but the the the, the exploitation is bad is in some ways Maybe not a moral, but at least a normative proposition, right? Like if Mm -hmm. you're a certain kind of reactionary, you just don't care. Like you can admit it. Like, oh yeah, Marx is right about that. Who fucking cares? We're the we run everything. Shut the fuck up. Like, um, you know, and sometimes you'll get you'll get most people, even even most capitalists can't admit that to themselves, but sometimes you admit you you will meet people who are honest about it. Um the The problem that you have, though, is in Marxism, there's the there's the Hegelian way, which is from Kant, the in itself and for itself distinction. So there's a sociological class and there's a class for itself. I think in complexity, you actually have an easier way to understand this, which is a Mm -hmm. class organized as a collective, which has a collective imaginary. Mm-hmm. And a collective and collective institutions that can give it something like agency. Individuals have agency, groups don't. But if you have mm-hmm. the more the more organizational capacity to have, the more you have something analogous to agency emerging in groups. Otherwise, you just have aggregation, yeah. which is just like the ten, the tendencies that emerge out of the chaos of whatever's happening to a certain sector of the population. Yep. And what we see right now with the working class is we have a fuck lot of things we can describe in aggregate. But very yeah. little things we can describe as collective agents. Yeah. Yep. I think that's totally right. I think that's exactly, I mean, that's, that's how I think about that, that like that are those two kind of paradigms converging, right. That it's like, and, 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 you know, and again, going back to what I, you know, my kind of concept of organizing, the process of organizing is that kind of drawing all those pieces, aligning all those pieces and and creating that capacity for uh, collective thought, collective agency, right? Like, um, and and you know, it, it goes through the gamut of kind of it goes from psychology to organizational theory to political theory, right? Like, it's mm-hmm. it, it it has to involve all of those things because you know, in in a kind of like. It, it, and that's why I'm interested in cybernetics because it it's like any institution that hopes to do any kind of organizing and power building at any scale has to be operating at all those levels, right? Um, and then like what you talked about is earlier is the moral level, and that's also something that I think is 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 that's part of it, right? Um, like yeah, I, you Marxists know, I went, will try to tell you that it isn't, but I I this is where I think they're kind of but. There's I a think we see Marx that collapse the normative and descriptive in ways that like is not entirely self honest. But when so. you're talking about organizing, right? Like you need to mm-hmm. have a morality because people have morality, right? Like it's it's not right. Like it's not an objective morality. It's a pragmatic morality, right? Yeah. Like our, our objective in so this is why I always talk about virtue ethics actually as opposed to the other kinds of morality like utilitarianism. Uh, yeah, and it's because like a virtue. When people ask me if I'm a moral realist, and I'm like, no, the the virtues don't like exist in a platonic form in the universe in which you can just access. But once you define a virtue and have a model for what it is, right, which is the Aristotelian way of doing it, okay, we 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 know what charity is, we define the people that have this trait that we call charity, we do what they do. That yeah. is a subjective. And even consequentialist process, it's just not rule based. It's not rule consequentialism, and yeah. it's also not going to lead to one morality. Like I, I would say, for example, even no. if we're talking about the difference between bourgeois morality and um, and worker morality or, or, or proletarian morality, um, there's going to be multiple proletarian yeah. moralities because there's multiple proletarian but, virtues. But, I, mean, right? I mean, this is why the high point of 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 socialism and fascism happened at the same time, right? But yeah, like, with, with some over, I mean, like 
with the leaders of both overlapping, which I think yeah. the bases don't overlap, but then, you know, but then every now and then Marxists are like, yeah, but so we don't have any no. responsibility. And I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, you do. But, you know, and, and, and I don't I don't know if you read the, the other paper I sent you, but this is kind of what I'm getting into there. You know, like like I think that there are I don't I don't think that there are. I, I do think that there are like evolutionarily discernible psychological roots to morality, right? Like I, I'm not like a huge fan of of height, but I, you know, especially a lot of the research he relies on, I think is good psychological research, right? That like, yeah. you know, and I, and I, I like, I, you know, I think I, at least I'm temperaments are genetic, actually, are well. No, let me rephrase that. I think they're heritable. I actually have no idea what's genetic about them, and I think that's due to, to some degree over speculation. But, but the thing is, like, um, what I mean by heritable is like there's a mixture of natural temperament uh, from whatever, probably partly from genes, part a lot of it's triggered from environment, and then, um life experiences you know the species being as modified by your social reproduction scheme and marxism uh which which when i realized that that's what marx was on about people think i got that from marx no this was what i got from studying um anthropology i was like oh there are some base temperaments and tendencies that humans have yeah like um, no, and, and, and I don't morality think is one of them. <laughs> like, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and morality. Yeah, exactly. Right. I, I don't think that I, I don't think about it in a hard and like in a strong way. I just I think about Not in, it. Not like, in, what is it? The the, the Michael Shermer way? <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> that my no, libertarian I mean, morality, is, as long as it's fair, like comes from like, but from from from, from geology, from, that's or from uh, from genetics. Yeah, right. no, I, I mean, I think I, I think I'm much more but like, I do think there are pretty strong in group out group distinction making processes in social groups, right? Like, absolutely. That, and right? symbolic kinship is a big one to you. Right? right? Yeah, exactly. That, I mean, that is that's what that is, right? Symbolic kinship or, you know, and, and it and, and I think that, that, like, from the organizing perspective, that, that's another way to talk about this conversation we've been having, right? That like, how easy is it? to create a collective, like to do like friend enemy distinction, right? Within any particular place. That's harder, the more complex, the more convoluted, the more atomized, the less structured your existing kind of workplace or whatever the universe that you're trying to organize is, right? right. Like if it's I very mean, clear, if there's one boss and it's very clear, like- They suck, the we all hate them. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and we realize, hey, there's 50 of us. I mean, like I, this is what I meant. People have asked me what I mean when I say sometimes it's human. Human competitiveness is actually part of why there's egalitarianism. And people go, what? I'm like, we don't like to be bossed because mm -hmm. we are competitive as a species. And you know what we did to people who bossed us when we were in tribal bands? We fucking killed them. Like, or or, or we it, developed. Like are ethics. we exile them? Are we would beat them in the place yeah. and then reaccept them? I mean, but but if they were absolutely resistant, like I'm I'm not like I'm not currently no, yeah, yeah, like yeah. mass mass. I'm not I'm actually not one of the people who does guillotine means because I think it's I think it it plays in the wrong elements of I think playing in resent that when socialists touch on the resentment towards the rich that they're not that they're they're like half right but they're not right about the right things and nor what we should um well because it's overly it's 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 overly moralistic right like it's the morality has to serve a social aim right because right. at the end More of the than day just revenge at the end of the day right i mean if you can leverage revenge to build like social power great but like at the end of the day the rich people aren't the enemy. It's the fact that they're rich. Right. I mean, <laughs> right. Well, this, I get in, like, I get back. Like I have some conservative friends, like you're never talking about the elites enough. And I'm like, you mean specific ones? Because like, yeah, I could point out the banality of evil, but in a certain sense, like Marxists have always said that usually confuses people to think that if you got rid of the individual, the that are are even the shitty type 
this is where stuff like structural anti-Semitism and stuff actually is real. Like, uh, the, oh, we get rid of all the like, the, the like financiers. Like, I I think finance capitalism needs to be talked about again in a real sense. And like, there is a way in which it is more parasitic than entrepreneurial capitalism. Uh, but it's also still a subset of capitalism. It's not actually fundamentally different. And you can't have either one of those two kind, kinds of capitalism or I talk about rentier capitalism, rentier capitalism or whatever. You can't have that without the basic MCM circuit, right? Yeah. Now, this is me talking Marx stuff. But basically what yeah, I mean yeah, is yeah. like like you have to have exploitation and production for any of that other stuff to exist. Like as par- yeah. even if it's yeah. more parasitic, um, well, it's just it's 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 the it's whatever allows that accumulation to take place. It doesn't actually care about what how related it is to the physical world. I mean, this is where the kind of, I mean, this is where I think I, I, I this is where the kind of legal framework I think comes in and is really important, right? That that mm-hmm. the law is able to create new kind of horizons of capitalist accumulation, right? Absolutely. And as long as, as long as they're legitimated, I mean, basically as long as they're made by the United States and other countries with like, in, with physical institutional power to maintain AKA the, the guns law. And, and right, yeah. Guns and factories. Gun, guns, factories, food production, right. power production, you know, all the physical ability, like the physical footprint of, of, of an economy, right? Like, so like, you know that 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 you can that you can create a capitalism that is increasingly like like in out of the world, <laughs> right? Well, I mean, least, like one of the things that I but, will tell people, for example, that entrepreneurial single proprietor capitalism is bad as it is, and and I do think it's bad. I am not one of these people who thinks we could even go back. That's like the libertarian right dream, right? If we could all go back to entrepreneurial individual sole proprietor capitalism. Um, but the one thing I will say about it, for example, um, tech layoffs, what are tech layoffs about? Now I've heard recently they're about uh, social contagion. No, they're fucking not. They're about temporarily bumping a stock. Why are they temporarily bumping a stock at the expense of the long-term viability of the country of the company? Because under our current legal construction of capitalism, that's actually legally fucking mandated and that's a way to do yeah. it well i mean like, it's, it's 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 you can you just can get sued for not doing it <laughs> right same with stock I mean, right. same with irrational seemingly irrational things like high levels of stock buybacks etc yeah like like that those all pump up stock prices and you they also re- remove your ability to get sued entrepreneurial capitalists would never do any of that shit and they would also not lay off in that way why would they not do it? Because, yes, not to say they wouldn't lay off people and fire people, but, like, laying off labor the way tech's doing it right now is actually costly. Not only in, like, severance packages and all that, but also in, like, law stability over time. And we actually know from, from basic corporate legal studies, actually, for, and business studies, that most of the profitability is never gained back from the from the layoffs. That it... it, it temporary wow. spikes the stocks profitability doesn't return and then something's going to come out and buy the company out like someone's going to wow. gobble it up leading to increased monopolization like when people are like oh it's social contagion i'm like social contagion is a way of renaming something without telling you why it's happening um so yeah <laughs> social but, contagion know, just means something's happening <laughs> yeah something's happening people are doing something socially and uh like <laughs> there are three theories of social contagion echo theory but what's funny is they actually mostly apply to individuals and in institutions anyway echo theories like you see something good happening somewhat like uh like someone has some kind of religious ecstasy or like sexual ecstasy or literal ecstasy in the case of drugs um, and like you respond by mimicking that because you want that result. That's one kind of social contagion. We understand how it works. The other kind is mm-hmm. there's a kind of aggression or something that you just, you already want to do it, but there's a social imposition on it. But in a group context, the social imposition is removed and then you rip someone apart. All right. Mm-hmm. We know how that works. 
there's this third thing that's literally called hysterical social contagion. And like, we don't know how it works. And I'm like, so you don't, so you're just renaming something that you like don't understand basically. Right. But when you apply it to like fucking corporations, I'm like, corporations aren't like people. They're responding to legal and structures. And yeah, individual, like you could have an individual uh, company act irrationally because one CEO is willing to get sued, right? That that can absolutely happen, but that will never constitute a trend. Like, because mm-hmm. it's legally, structurally not possible for the system to operate and people just constantly be willing to rest lawsuit. Like, yeah. so... And that's really important for understanding a lot of things. So let's get, you know, we're talking about the problems of labor right now. Why, like, we, I think when people hear me talk about how I think the labor movement right now isn't real, what I am not saying is there is not labor militancy. I think that absolutely is real. And that's what people are responding to. That's real. They're, we're finally seeing some gains in certain parts of the service sector. Um, we don't know what it means. Those those things still haven't even got the first round of contracts done yet. We don't know what it's going to equal. I have no idea how they strike, for example. Like, 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 yeah, okay, you strike, you shut down your store, but like that doesn't mean anything to Starbucks corporate, not really. Um, no, yeah, you know, I mean, it's an interesting thing, right? Because, like, you know, in, in some sense, having new, especially these like unaffiliated, like very kind of worker driven movements of, mm. uh, of labor, like I think is potentially something new, right? Like it, it's, it, it's not something new, but it's maybe reinventing something old, whatever. But the point is that it's an, it's a dynamism. It's a, it's an, it's an, you know, th- there's a motivation behind it that I think, potentially portends something even if overall we're losing members right like because i think that labor like if you if like like we, we said like you know if we lost all the cop unions the labor numbers would go down but would it affect the prospect of a labor movement or a resurgence of, no, it, it has uh, right no it wouldn't shift to that either it, right like, and and, and that doesn't just apply to the that that doesn't just apply to the cops, right? That applies to a lot of labor that is just coasting, like from a from a political kind of class formation society. If you're not part of doing something to help build a movement, then you know losing a hundred members here and there, a hundred members of a stagnant, you know, uh, old labor union, and a hundred new Starbucks workers, like that's not an even trade, actually. You know what I mean? Well, it's interesting when people like talk about Barbara Ehrenreich and the PMC. Like, I think most things are PM, like most things about the PMC are confused, like as a as a category. But I do think this is where I, I actually talk about the rational truth of what people get at by the PMC is that there is a strata of professionalized, cartelized workers mm-hmm. that. And some of it's tied to education. Some of it's actually not. I, I actually like. Like, I'm sorry, but like the the uh, the post office union is no longer radical. That's also professional catellas. It's actually mostly of color even. But like things don't always work the way that you're, you know, that leftists think they would on cultural grounds. Um, the, these places are, are relatively safe. Historically speaking, the nurses and teachers unions were among when they first came about, which is kind of why they were allowed where even though they were militant in the beginning, they were kind of passive all the way until the Great Recession. Um, and and they were mostly like administrative things that was really there as a counterpoise, not even to, to the bosses, but to the goddamn state. Like, um, because the state was exploiting workers. Um, which... Not in the sense that Marxists mean by it. They weren't getting, they weren't extracting excess value from it, but they were disciplining society by disciplining teachers and, and nurses and things that I don't know what you call them in the Marxist framework. I tend to think of us as labor aristocrats, honestly, but barely. Um, we're barely that. And we're radicalized because we're increasingly 
precaritized, even though we have a relatively stable high credential job, like so few people stay in it, whatever. So when you look at like the last 20 years, where the union growth is and where the union militancy is are actually not the same place. So there's been union militancy, even in red state teachers unions. I mean, people have been bucking yeah. the you like people don't realize this, but those strikes that happened in like after the shit went down in Wisconsin from like 2014 to like 2017, Eric yeah, uh, yeah. Blanc's book is actually good on this on um, red state revolt. Those were like actually even sometimes against the advisement of the NEA and the AFT, and they were drag kicking and screaming into it. Like, like at least at the national level, the locals were probably more supportive. And in some cases they had to ouster those unions, like in Chicago to, to do anything about what was happening to them. Um, what worries about what I worry about now is that the teachers into that are giving up. Like they're just leaving the profession. Uh -huh. Like, so you, you're losing all these people who, who are young, but also now all the people older than me are gone too. Like, so it's becoming a highly precaritized profession and the union doesn't have any response and it doesn't know. It's not even because it doesn't want to, this is not just a failure of leadership vision. It's also like, what can it do? Like they're even winning certain kinds of better contract conditions, but the working conditions and the dignity conditions are so bad. Mm -hmm. And there's so much political opposition from the state that even though it's able to get concessions from like local school boards, it's still not worth it. Like that's a new scenario and that's where we're at right now. But a lot of these people, a lot of teachers, like you just go through socialist movements. Like how many of them are fucking public school teachers? Tons, like mm -hmm. tons. Um, and then, and then the other really militant unions right now are like the nurses unions who were quiet for a long time and really started getting more and more militant around the battles around the ACA during the Great Recession. Um, and then recently just about how now they're not just fighting for their patients. Now they're fighting for themselves because their working conditions have gotten so shit yeah. during, uh, during COVID. Um, and honestly, the doctors and, and physicians, professional organizations are also struggling. Th those aren't unions. Those are professional advocacy groups. But yeah. just because, like, we, we have, we, I, I mean, socialists don't talk about this that much anymore, but we have a shortage of even fucking doctors and high paid professionals in these fields. The only, like, field that we have an overabundance of, sorry, Abby, is yours. <laughs> um, don't, there's trust like, me. don't I know it? Too many goddamn don't I know lawyers. It. Don't I know it? Um, um, just had I had brunch today with a bunch of unemployed lawyers. You guys are on my mind. Um, uh, but but in one sense, that makes the current response to the PMC kind of interesting. This was Aaron Wright's point because you have you have this university cultural left that is a real problem in a block, and they're really into like racial wealth gaps and stuff like that and, and like people like reed say look that's about an elite and who gets led into that elite and diversifying an elite right and i think reed's kind of right about that but then there's this other part of the same nominal group if you think pmc status is defined by being part of the what 40 percent of the population that has a degree um that's also increasingly acting like militant labor did a hundred years ago and has an easier time doing it. Cause the one thing you can say about hospitals and schools until COVID anyway, is that they were still organized like factories. Yeah. Which nothing else was. And actually one of the things that I used to tell people that I don't think people realized is like the attack on schools as factories in the school reform movement, some of that was for the benefit of the students and it was to get the factory model of education. They were trying to replace it though with a consumer model of education, which is worse. Mm. Um, but the other thing it, it does is it weakens teachers ability to organize. Uh -huh. um, 
that's what charter schools were used for. That's explicitly what that's the only the only benefit to the state other than allowing legal grift from a charter school is that it relaxes the requirements of schooling, a.k.a. it makes it easier to get teachers and you can stop them from unionizing. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And if you have to tolerate having to close down these schools periodically because they're stealing masses of money from the government, you can do that as long as you protect your senators when you do. Um, So I think this puts us in a weird scenario because what I think one of the things that I think a lot of people have like not wanted to look at when it comes to Marxism, Marx's critique of the peasants is what? Is it because the the peasants are reactionary because of what? Peasants are reactionary because their only forms of socialization is not in labor, but in church. Mm -hmm. Right. And that because of that, um, they're going to often side with hierarchical institutions unless things are so bad that they see their lot in the, in with the proletariat, which in, in cases of the periphery, they tended to, but not in the cores of capital. Um, but it's not because the peasants weren't victimized. They totally were. Like, we don't have peasants anymore. Um, but I ask you to think about this from like a systems theory perspective. If the point of, the, of Marx's critique of the peasantry was alienation, right? And his critique of the lumpen is alienation plus the fact they sometimes directly exploit other people within the working class if they're like active feuds or whatever. Um and that made them given the things like Bonapartism, proto-fascism, etc. because of that. What do you think the working class is now? Because I actually can tell you that compared to most modern workers, village peasant life seems really unalienated. I, I've hung out with village peasants in Oaxaca, Mexico. It does. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like and you'd rather be. Uh, you, this is not to romanticize vigil parent life because it's shitty. But if I have the choice between being pro uh, lumpenized in a city or a poor peasant, I take being a poor peasant over that any day. Like, like I have some community, I have some religious affiliation. Yes, it you might have be to- delusional, but I have community to take care of me. I have family. I have extended oh, have- family. I mean, even at a more basic level, right? Like you have a place to live that is stable. Right. <laughs> right. And and you have people who will support you. You know, even if you don't formally own where you live, you, you, you no one's going to fuck with it. No one wants to live in a fucking peasant hovel. Like, and, and people... I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that, I mean, this is like the... Um, Versus no, being is, a homeless lumpen person in the city, but yeah, I'd much rather be a peasant. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I guess that's that's uh, that kind of comes back to this question of of organizing, right? And like the like the I I just remember when I was in the when I was working at the union, one of the things that that I always thought was like, we should be doing more social activities. Right. Yeah. Like, right. Like that, that, that like time. that that's, and I didn't have the language. Like I didn't have a kind of like articulation of it that other than I, it just seems like that would be a good thing to do to like build our, you know, to build what it is that is us, you know? And like, you know, in, in some ways, um, in like and a lot of that's what I, in new york at least i feel like that's a lot of what dsa does is like saturday picnic you know like let's have a party <laughs> which because like i think that it, a lot of what i mean obviously there's um dsa is pretty hard to pin down as far as what it is right like it's a million tendencies doing a million things but like but i do think that there's an expression of of that need right that like that we're kind of like if we're if we're evaluating where where the labor movement is or where the left is, which I, I don't think are unrelated questions, right? Like, um, like where we are is like the needing to build some kind of sociality to build well, a social base on, right? Like, what's funny is like if you ask the professional um, 
activists about that or like the really dedicated sectarian. And I know because you know, like when TIR did shows, it did shows with some people, it did shows with some people that I thought was suboptimal. TIR, this is revolution, but nonetheless, it did shows. And people were like, well, why are you doing that? And they would say, we're making a little bit of money and we're building community. Right. They're making a little bit of money. Is, no one, I, I can promise you, and I know the back end of the books, no one in TIR even makes half of what a fucking teacher makes. I know that for a fact. Like, so, so why are people so resentful of that? And, and they call it grifting immediately. Well, because there's this idea that anyone who engages in the, in the community building aspect of this has to be like completely altruistic. And given that there's nothing to support these people otherwise, and we don't have a party system that doesn't, it, and the DSA doesn't, and I actually pointed this out, like, don't tell me that we, we don't have the kind of money the right does, but we do have money, and we do not do what the right, the right will take working class intellectuals, make sure they get a good, make sure, they'll JD Vance your ass. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll make sure you get a good position in the military, they make sure you come out and you are totally beholden to them because you had no future otherwise. And you did the things that people had no future do. You went into the military and they made sure you weren't a grunt and got shot. Like, yeah, I mean, they do I shit that, like that. And we don't like, so, yeah. I mean, I think that that's, you know, I think that's a, yeah. I mean, we like the, I mean, you know, I don't know what exactly we is. I mean, you know, th there, there is a kind of liberal kind of, you know, there is the liberal kind of NGO complex that does that to some degree. But the NGO but does not... that, but it doesn't do it working class people. It does it with other people no. who are already well off. Almost usually yeah. it's downwardly mobile people from affluent backgrounds. I literally just had like occasionally, and I don't mean this to call you out, but it's like, really bright working class people who happen to be of another race and from another country. They will also sometimes do. That's it. Like, I'm not from another country. No, no, but, <laughs> but someone in your background is so you can. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean like, like, it, like the number of people I know, God, I'm going to sound like I'm a dossie, but who like, well, I was, you know, really hanging out with this cool Nigerian and I'm like, Okay, how did they get here? Where did their background when they got here? Like, like because I know what the yeah. immigration laws are from oh. Africa. Like, wow. like so the people we're going to get from Africa are like the 0.5%. Like, well, you know, my, like, like, like you said, my dad, I mean, my, my dad is from Ethiopia. A lot, a lot of, I mean, the Ethiopians got in because of uh, anti-communist policy. Yeah, I was about um, to say it's anti-communist policy and a little bit not, of Christian privilege, a little bit. Yeah, but I, I, yeah, but I mean, you know, my family's Muslim, but which is the secret of Ethiopia. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of us, but uh, <laughs> don't tell anyone. But, You're not um, only Italian. Um <laughs> but but right, so Ethiopian Ethiopians. I mean, you know, um, the, you you do. It's not just you know. It's it, 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 the Ethiopian community is a lot more kind of uh, class diverse, I'd say. Like you know, yeah, yeah, lot, that's true. Like the Somali lower. community, well, and like... yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like, but 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 what you say is true about. Um, I, I I do think that like you know I mean same in like India and Pakistan like a lot you know a lot of places a lot of our immigration policy is geared a lot of our legal immigration policy is geared right. towards you know highly educated uh, upper class uh, like what whereas we rely on a you know informal immigration policy for migrant workers and service sector and you know so it, it's it's a two pronged beast but um but now i've i've, I've I've, I've, I've yeah, lost track I, a little bit. But when we talk about why this is systemically difficult, right? Like even something like, I'm going to say like the United Colors of Benetton Race Reductionist Coalition yeah. is almost impossible to keep together. Um, even if you just limited it to black people, like there's a whole lot of effort right now to hold the black community together, right? Why? Mm -hmm. Because there's natural tensions between immigrants from the Caribbean and from 
and from um, and from Africa and and African Americans, not because there's an inherent tension with immigrants, but because because of racist immigration policies, who mm-hmm. gets allowed to come in except in very explicit geopolitically like earmarked communities, Ethiopia, Somalia, um, some people in West Africa, like it has some rest. But they're almost always in on, under refugee status, usually on the auspices of anti-communism, and usually because the U.S. fucked up in that country somehow. Like, and then everybody else is like, well, we're dealing with like, the elite of the elite who fought, you know, who's probably like killing someone's ancestors in the Biafra wars. Like, and, you know, and, and, um, are like super skilled people, like the best and brightest of, of Africa who didn't have a lot of chances. Otherwise they might be, you know, to assuage someone's conscious let in. So Southeast Asia, definitely the case. I mean, one of the richest, you know, the two richest minority groups in America are Nigerian Americans and, and like Indian Americans. Those are not rich countries. It's, you know, it's who we let in. Yeah. yeah. Um, I I talked about what, like the difference between U.S. and Canada and like perception of chic Punjabi Indians is vastly different because of our immigrate. Like we associate Punjabi Indians with like um highly skilled labor because of the particular nature of our immigration policy whereas canada had at one point slightly more open and so chic people make up a large part of like a lower middle class working class strata and i'm like those associations are very different and the reasons are are systemic because of immigration policy well that makes a lot of this racial like united colors and benetton racial shit a lot harder to argue when you have people who are often the spokesperson for, and actually until the Floyd stuff, I will admit, who are often the, the spokesperson for like, oh, you know, white oppression are like, well, yeah, but you're from the richest minority group in the country if we look at sub demographics. Like, <laughs> like, I mean, this is like, this is where the like people of color term, this is why it had to get changed. I mean, I would, I, I remember when that I think first BIPOC came is about, also, uh, is that game, on the way out too? I have no idea. Well, one of the things is, is it alienates the Latin community, I guess, because Latins can become white easier. Uh, but it also, like, in a way, that still is kind of weird because I'm like, but like, and, and, and the, if you look at the intersectionality of class and race, yeah. it like breaking the Latin and the black community up is really dividing the working class and, and like poor petty bourgeoisie apart from each other like which is effectively what it is doing um and so like you know but yeah i mean people of color was always sort of like a united but bipoc is another interesting one um because a lot of people a lot of people in the latin and asian community feel like it's trying to class them as white and i'm like "Eh, no Uh, i think all of these are kind of suboptimal like but you need well, something to build a collective identity off of right like well, yeah i mean like, i mean yes i mean you know that's a, i mean that's, i'm the white guy who's saying it's suboptimal too so no but but you know th- i think what you're bringing it back to to the to our conversation right that building you know how are we building a collective identity what are the strategies that are being employed right like I think that what you're kind of highlighting with a kind of rank kind of um, like w- when you're when you're trying to I mean the problem is when you're trying to combine too many people with too much internal diversity into a category right there is no process to create any coherence out of it right because the internal contradictions are as many as any arbitrary group of people that you right. would pick from a society, right? Which is so why when you, you still say, need dialectics, but go ahead. Right? No, right? So, so, so when you say like you know when you you try to create all these categories that have, you know, and I try to avoid like I I really try to avoid like in get like even speaking the words race versus class because I I think that it makes 
it's it's just a framing that's wrong. Yeah, but like both class reduction and race reduction doesn't piss me off. Although I just I, I will cause, say cause, I'm, I am class first, but you know I would be. Well, I mean I, I I just to me it's like like I I guess cla- like honestly class as a term is the, so easy to I mean, abuse. It, what, cause it, but it's also, it's just a completely generic word, right? Like, so it's just inherently going to be a problem without a lot of context building, right? Absolutely. So, Which is why and, I spend so much time explaining people, you just can't say working class and it be magic. No. Like, and so, but so with any of these things, like, like you have to, I think, think of them as a power building project, right? And like, like, is it possible with like, you know, you can't go, you can't say there's, you can't come to organizing from the assumption that there is a coherent community first, and then say that it's just my job as an organizer to like, you know, to triumphantly evoke it. Right. Like it is, like you say, it's a dialectical process of, of, figuring out what the coherence is right right and And it's not just a problem you brought this up in your paper about the tensions between the old left and the new left is because the old the old left critique of the new left is valid that it becomes totally cultural but conversely there was a real sense in which some other contradictions in society that that like that even like the cpusa tried to address like for example uh, what they used to call white skin privilege and like uh, the contradictions of the wages of whiteness uh, and stuff like that, or the failure of reconstruction um, that particularly after the popular front period, because they have to be back in league with a explicitly white supremacist at the time party, like explicitly, not implicitly like mm-hmm. the Dixiecrats are explicit about it. Um that leads to all kinds of like weird ass politics that you can't get around just by saying, Oh, well the class was united back then because it wasn't united. There were times when it was united um, on organizational lines in the early thirties that after you, after they put it back in the coalition with the Dixiecrats, that actually stops. And there's Mm -hmm. a tension between white workers and black workers that intensifies that was actually relieved by like what the IWW or even the uh, the TUUL, um, which is the um, which was the CPUSA's like first attempt at something like the before they entered the I the the I um, the CIO um, that they were really big on like we're doing multiracial organizing, but we're not asking you to like join the party of the fucking segregationists, right? Those are different ass, but that, that really put like, when you ask yourself that, then all of us, like you remember like, Oh, the Stalinists that were encouraging the black belt thesis were also telling us to vote for the same people who were the Dixiecrats who were literally oppressing us. Like, like that, the, the, the context of why the new left did what it did becomes a lot more clear like it was a real problem that was unaddressed yeah 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 i mean i i I think you know that that's that's absolutely i mean you know the kind of demarcation point i think that i talked about was 1964 the um mississippi freedom democratic party doesn't get their seats um doesn't get seated and you know, I, I, you know, I just read another, you know... Uh, that whole weird thing with, like, Lyndon Johnson is agreeing to sign the Civil Rights Act for them, but they won't even let him in the goddamn room. Like, because they have to... Like, he has to meet him outside of the room because of... So they want to fend the Dixie crap parts of that? I think that's, like, in 65. That's so wild to me. Like... Yeah. But, you know, and, and, it's, and it's, you know, it's... it's you know, it, it's one of those things. It, it, what, like, what uh, an incredibly turbulent moment that you know there was this, you know, class or cadre of the civil rights movement, you know, Martin Luther King included, right? That mm-hmm. what, like, and and LBJ included, right? That that to some degree, right? Mm-hmm. That wanted to create more basically social democracy. I think you know, 
I imagine there are elements who wanted to go much farther than that, but like that, 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 that the project was had to turn away from a liberal rights struggle towards a social welfare economic struggle, right? Like because the bill was a job guarantee, right? Which, right? which was, would be a huge fight if anyone, I mean, you know, I, I mean, today it's almost unimaginable, but um, right. Well, like, it's even hard to imagine it in like the social democratic countries today. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Right. So, because I mean, like, again, and you know, like, and, and I think that in one sense, it's pretty hard to underestimate what that does to capital uh, because it actually is a threat to capital. Right. That's like, a real one. Yeah. Like, the like, um, but that fight doesn't happen. Right. Because the basic, I mean, in a lot of ways, because there's just the blatant violence and the, the moral shock of it. <laughs> right. Maybe like is one way to just say what happened is, was too much. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you get, um, you get the new left I think also, you know, obviously, I think that that, I mean, you know, it's hard for us to get into the mentality of the time, but you know, you read about it, and I, I, I think that the kind of anti-colonial struggles, and obviously, the Vietnam War had had played a huge role, but it, it, it's hard, it, it's hard to get back in there and say how could, but like, you know, looking back on that split, it's like, how could we, how could like you know, how could we have actually like taken over the country? Right? <laughs> like, it's just like, it's like the, the whole thing of a socialist revolution in America at the peak of its military power, right? At the peak of, of capitalism's ec- ascendance, right? Is like, it, it, it seems fanciful now, but like, you know. But it also that... would have been the most, like, you want to talk about something, you know, the socialists always focus on Germany and for good reason, and we could talk about that because they've given up on they given up on uh, the UK because of empire. They given up on France because of empire. Germany was the most developed capitalist country. They didn't really have an empire, right? To to like offset part of its working class. That was the the whole deal there, right? But if yeah. if you have a socialist revolution in what in, in 1950s is the core of capital and the imperial core, and it it like starts to dismantle. Like, and like, oh, well, we have the stuff to like dismantle and empower people like in an eight, like, like the national revolutions go a different way. They don't end up getting suckered back into like, you know, third world as capitalist regimes or whatever. Like that, I get why people put so much hope in that, because if that had happened, that yeah. is, that's like, if the Bolsheviks can connect up with the Espe Day in Germany and you had a, and you had a base for, for for the USSR that wasn't just, you know, the periphery. That's a huge different thing, um, but it doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. Like, and that's, you know, and what I think today, you know, I, this is maybe, I, I'm always skeptical when I, st- when I, even on myself, when I start like, well, this psychological explanation explains a lot, but I'm going to do it today. Cause I think it might help. Um, we are like the children of that failure in a way that it's indirectly traumatized us. And I hate, I also hate trauma talk, but I think this is the only way to understand that in ways that make us both militant and also kind of fucking dysfunctional. Like, because there's a whole lot of ways where there's, where because of that failure, there's an incentive now to look like, well, we have this mission. you like, we're in the core of the beast. We have this mission in the core and we know that it's awful, that it's awful, but the way we try to go about it, it's ways that systemically don't make any fucking sense. Like um, the idea that you're going to convince people purely on moral grounds or anti-imperial grounds that don't benefit them for any of this. It's like, like most people don't want to hurt other people, but they also don't care that much. Like let's, particularly if people are far away let's let's be kind of honest about that like if you don't have to see it and deal with it then it's not something that's on your active moral radar a lot of the time yeah 
Yeah. Like, and I think that's true for the majority of population. And I think also a lot of socialists like, well, that makes, you know, Westerners or, you know, whatever awful. And I'm always just like, that's kind of still missing the point. Like, like any group of people would be like that more than likely. Like, I don't see, you know, I don't see people in Asia, for example, crying huge tears about shit in Africa either. Like, yeah. um, that's not always true. I mean, like, there's developmental programs and whatnot, but that's a huge thing. And the other thing I think is a big block, like, if we're talking about this systemically, and I guess the complexity issues here, game theoretically... If you read the work of uh, Adam Spiserowski, I always call him Spiserowski, but I think the P is silent. Um, never capitalism, it. social democracy. You see that if you limit your organization to a nation state, national developmentalism will usually feed back into capitalism from a game theoretic point of view. It's just the easiest path to go on to mm -hmm. seemingly reward workers. Mm -hmm. However, that restarts the cycle that suppresses workers, uh -huh. like, every time. So the only way out of that cul-de-sac is either to give up on socialism as a, as a project, which is what uh, Pisarowski, who started off as an analytical Marxist and kind of ends up as like a, kind of like a white social democrat does, or to say that, no, there really is a truth to the fact that there is no way to do socialism in one country because the incentives are bad. And so you have to connect up with other places. The problem with that structurally is every bit of analysis and law and everything we think about as leftists who are focused on the state encourages you to be methodologically and systemically nationalist. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. Uh, because there's capital flight risk unless you're like the core. And even the yeah. core, there's some capital flight risk. Yeah. No, I mean, this is uh, getting into, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, this is getting into bigger territory, I think. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. like, but, you know, I, I just finished the, I mostly finished that uh, on your recommendation, the, the Peter Zion book, the newest mm -hmm. one. Um, and I think that, you know, there's, there's an interesting conversation to be said about the kind of the future of, of, of how that plays out in, in, a, in, a, in a less globalized future. Um, but <laughs> but, but, let, let, uh, but even the less globalized future... Like, like even because I think decoupling is is gonna happen. I think we live. We think we live in a multipolar world. I have no goodness or badness attached to that. Like to me, that's that's not that's a systemic effect of some of the byproducts of neoliberalism. Thinking that that's good or bad for your politics is basically coping. It's just a thing. But no, it's it's a new terrain to to orient towards. Right. Um, but I think even with that we are not going to be nationalists towards our integration with Canada and Mexico and, and all that. Like, like these multipolar blocks are still polar. Like, because you start getting, you start breaking up North America uh, as a trade block or whatever. Everyone's economy collapses here. Like, yeah. um, the United so, States so is slightly better set to handle it. Cause we have a lot of food, but even that's limited. I mean, and, and uh, yeah, but so, and, and we don't know. <laughs> yeah, and we have no idea. The thing is, we don't we go, know what happens at that point, but even Zion, assume, and like, I, I want people to know that, like, I tell people to read Peter Zion because if the, if one of the apologists for the system thinks that this is what the system is doing, yeah, it's prop like, because I don't share science politics like at all. No, he has a, there's a creepy kind of, there's a creepy undercurrent to that book. Yeah, there's of, there's a kind of gross China. and realism. knowing that this guy is that he's talking to a lot of military people. It, it, there's an ideological underpinning of of kind of uh, that feels a little genocidal to me. But like, oh yeah, me too, me too. Or it, at least is like, look, 
I mean, it seems to be arguing. That, Look, we can just let China like fall apart and die. Yeah, it's, and like, it's like ah, it's like, like how's that like, work? How did that work out with Russia? <laughs> like, like For... that's a that's a bad idea, dude. <laughs> like, yeah, know? like like because I'm like China's gonna have a demographic crisis, of which I, I think all the developed world has a democratic crisis, including China. But yeah. I do think he has a point that like the scale of just how big fucking China is in terms of population means we don't really know what, what just a normal developmental demographic crisis that we're all facing looks like in that scale of a population. Yeah. Like we don't know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, but at the same, at the same time, there's just this kind of scary glee about yeah. that, that I'm yeah. like, no, we should be like, working with them like th th this is a it, point where you could actually have international cooperation but it like, would be one th especially considering like the completely like like the idea like how deep we tied our economies are but right i mean it, it, it's just to me you combine it with the kind of like like the the kind of audience that he's talking to and it's like oh boy yeah um Yo, yeah but this is definitely a like know your enemy but like read the smart parts of your enemy <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, because again, again, it's hard to find, you know, it's hard. To, I mean, maybe this, maybe you could disagree with me, but I think there's not that many like thorough materialist leftists, right? No. Who are looking at the world in like in a, in a very material way to try to get a sense of the inertial factors, like what is out there and how is it moving, right? Like, that you know that that we like to talk politics on the left and talk at, at a level of abstraction, um, but we don't like to dive into the details. Um, and some of those details are like, you know, really several hundred thousand tons, yeah. <laughs> right? They weigh a lot. <laughs> so right, but yeah, I mean, I think theory removed from empirical reality is basically. I mean, it's it's basically a non-starter. Like, and unfortunately, I was thinking about this. Somebody asked me today why I have people read Baudrillard, for example. And I actually am a critic of Baudrillard. Um, I, I don't know if people pick that up. Because, they're, like, even when Baudrillard's right, there's this free-floatingness about who the they are and where the classes are and who the classes are that just isn't explored or explained or dealt with at all. Like, like it's so abstract it that it, there's stuff about it I think is real, but like I don't even know that Baudrillard could tell you why it was real, other than like simulation and simulacrum. But like, yeah, but yeah, but that's like an effect. What's the driver of yeah. that? Um, and like, why did that happen? What were the what were the economic conditions that really made that viable? And he'll start. I mean, it's funny because where it really shows up how wrong he is. And I haven't released this as we're talking, it might come out before this episode comes out, but I talk about like in 2007, he was talking about the end of capitalist business cycles right before he died in the book, uh, <laughs> the, the, the agony of power. And I was like in 2007 and it was released in 2010. I'm like, no one's like, Oh, so the business, the production cycle in capitalism doesn't matter anymore. It's all stimulation and blogging and rents forever, huh? Which, yeah. which, which has also been like there was a tr there's been a tendency in the last three years of both leftists and rightists to to do that too because of the importance of rentier relations, right? And, and I admit it's a much more important part of the economy post two thousand seven than than before it. Um, all that said they're disciplining and trying to pull shit back for a reason. And part of that is like the business cycle was getting out of control mm -hmm. with the, with an actual risk of, of, of hyperinflation. Even if you think it was through price gouging, like that was actually possible in a way that would have broke everything down and good old fashioned business cycle discipline is trying to be imposed. Yeah. Like, so in a very real sense, a lot of leftists, because they don't look at the, even when they try to look at the, 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 the material reality, they're not looking at trends over time. Like, 
you know, I always talk about this with monopoly capital. A lot of monopoly capitalists believe the fundamental contradiction of capital was over. And they were basing it off the U.S. economy in the 1950s because everybody in the Soviet Union predicted a massive depression that never came because uh, Keynesian economics mitigated the cycle for two whole business cycles longer than we were used to, basically. Um, it took an external shock and a, pol and a, and a policy response to that shock um, to really break it down. Uh, but I do think it was good. I, I don't I'm not one of those people who think that there was a whole lot of other options. Um, the, my my point about that is that uh, most of the theory that you see on the left now that's really popular actually was written and at first theorized in that context. Uh -huh. And it is often brought into our current context without any recognition. Even they'll, they'll, I mean, they'll mention neoliberalism, but they won't really go into all the things that changed, nor will they go into the continuity. And I think this is something that's interesting. I think there's more continuity, and Gabriel Winant is really good on this, uh, but there's more continuity between Fordism and neoliberalism than people realize because they both were super reliant on public private partnerships and not having the state do stuff. And even stuff like the jobs guarantee, which would I absolutely agree with you would have been dangerous to capital was still trying to move that stuff outside of the realm of the state to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, and so because of that, there is a continuity of a legal infrastructure, if nothing else that neoliberalism was actually able to pick up on, because of things decided on during the Fordist period. And that's and that's a huge thing to realize that like not only is it a negation of that and that the working class is really pushed out, but that a lot of the stuff that enabled neoliberalism to happen actually happened in the post-war social compact period. Like if you look at the long durée of things, that makes sense. Another thing to look at, like I've been reading all these communitarians lately and they talk about the yeah. end of civic republicanism to the neutral administrative state. And then now they're talking about the state of perpetual crisis, right? Since like 9-11. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And I'm like, well, that makes sense. But like, if you overlay these economic periodizations, they match up. Like, so for example, the, the end of civic republicanism and the development of the neutral state is Fordism then that that neutral state continues for the first half neoliberalism, but it's not functional anymore. I, I say the second half neoliberalism, we actually don't know, but it feels like neoliberalism is fundamentally changing somehow right now. Mm -hmm. um, so now we've seen like this perpetual crisis state that's mm -hmm. more like what we saw at the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. Um, that That like nobody, like... Even like the highly partisan, they can only legitimate themselves in crisis. They cannot offer a positive program. And mm -hmm. if you map the timeline for that, well, not only does it start mapping on climate change effects, but it also starts mapping on like neoliberalism not functioning the way it functioned for its first 20 years. Like, and so you can literally see like, oh, these political things these communitarians are talking about really do overlap almost to the fucking year with these economic things that are yeah. driving things in a real way. So, and if you don't have a systemic view of this, you'll never notice that. And, yeah. So I think, I mean, I think that, it, you know, as to, I think that's a, a note to kind of conclude this on, I think really is, what like coming back to these questions of organizing like what do we think like you know what what like what are the organizing or or the potentials that need to be created to 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 cope with the the second half of neoliberalism right like yeah you know what I mean? Like, because, um, you know, like what you, what you're saying, if, if, you know, if, 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 if our, if our theory is based is building our practice and we're building our theories on kind of, um, I mean, you know, mid-century or early 20th century 
models, right? Mm -hmm. What, you know, how do we reconceptualize or like, how do we, um, like, are there new capacities that we need to have? I um, think that's what we have to explore here. One of the things is we have to make working class people feel like they have a community and an actual stake in things. And even unions, frankly, don't often do that. You've been on the organizational end of a union and you, you know, you've done, and even I as a rep, like how much, you know, I have meetings with my, with my five members, uh, you know, every month and I can't even always even get to the rep meeting because it's at a time where I'm still under contract to work mm -hmm. like because they you know because it's they just haven't felt like the, the union itself has not changed its policies for changes in the workplace um of of the very place that it's operational yeah. so like and with the dsa i mean uh the dsa is is not organizationally nimble it's not like not organization what? Nimble. Like it's not it's not responsive in a lot of ways to changes in changes that are actually brought about by its own existence. Um, like which is kind of funny, but like like for example, doing so much of the organizational and constitutional work at one convention a year um, is basically predicated on the time that the DSA was a sect. With about five thousand members. Yeah, you know, I have a, you know, I have a perspective on that, which is, I mean, so I've gone to two conventions of DSA, mm -hmm. and I, 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 what I think it's doing, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm taking, I'm going to go meta on this, right? Because, like, the DSA as an institution has nothing nearing the capacity or political coherence to do most of the things that are proposed at the convention. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. But what it, to me, the, one of the most like useful things about the convention was like, honestly, just phenomenological. It's like experiencing mass democracy in some way is like not something you get to do. <laughs> Absolutely. And yet also the way that it's experienced also often turns people against it. Well, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it could go either way. It's, you know, but I, you know, I do think, you know, and, and I, the, New York had local conventions too. And, you know, to me, one of the things that would be useful would be, I, for DSA, I, and I think that one of the things that is useful for people who are more active, I'm not particularly active these days, but is gaining that experience of decision making, right? Like, and like, at one level, it's like, DSA makes all kinds of decisions all over the place that like, you know, are pretty, you know, again, like DSA is, is intentionally organized to not be coherent i think at this scale right like it just can't right like mm -hmm. and, and, and the cats on the, it's not going to be like at one point i had hoped that dsa would grow and split but now i'm kind of concerned that it's going to shrink and split <laughs> right <laughs> like, yeah i think that, that seems to be the most likely outcome is like the like the, the gaggle of different caucus and none of one of the interesting things about the caucuses none of the caucuses are over like 400 people like the caucuses are actually kind of micro sex, but they, because the DSA doesn't organized. have a, re but they're organized and there's no regional co. Like I, I thought that New York had a regional coalition because it has an effective like caucus at the at the state legislative level. But I was yeah. actually told that there's so much competition between the DSA locals that they couldn't get a regional coalition the way they got in California in New York, despite the fact they have regional you know, like state legislative caucuses and stuff. I'm like, that's crazy dysfunctional. Well, <laughs> like, you know, it's just one of those things. It's, 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 you know, having, it, having elected officials, it, it's, it's creating, wh whether we want to admit it or not, when you elect someone 
in when when someone becomes elected in our current system, they become an organization unto themselves. It's unavoidable. It's how it. Right. It's how it is. You get a staff. Have, you get a budget. Too, you get an office. Too. Right. Yeah. And, well, it, well. I mean, you're. I mean, in New York. There isn't another. I mean, there is technically a Republican Party, but like, like it's like you know what I mean. Like the New York Democrats range from like. <laughs> from like eric adams who's a cop and like you know right <laughs> like you know that that it's that it's the, the power is all democratic like uh, nominally right um right so, although, but the, but the, although the, interestingly that was the state that had probably the most republican success out of nowhere well um, i mean again that the, that's not unrelated right like you, you know that's absolutely that's just... if you're in a throw the bastards out moment it actually is going to look like red and blue states are getting all muddy is what normally yeah. happens but but uh, my only point is like i like i see dsa as a way to gain political and kind of this experiential democracy experience that i just don't know where else to get it but i think i mean I, you know I, I, obviously i get that, it that in it, a union but that's because yeah. i'm a rep so most yeah people don't. right and most people don't. Most people have no access to something like that, right? And so I think that it's it's like those. The, I, I don't think we should underlook those kinds of things as capacity building, even you know, even if it, you know, even if some of the kind of high level political decisions are, you know, you could criticize, right? Like I, I mean, I'm gonna like bring it back to a point you said earlier. Not just that the social stuff is important for capacity building, and that was vital. Yeah. Like the Communist Party, dude. If you were part of the European Communist Party in the fifties, you married in your party. You yeah. you you played on you played on leagues together. You took over your local civic organizations together. Like th you did not go to church. Like like these were. I'm not saying like I'm not actually pro that kind of forced laicism, believe it or not. But like. Like there was a sense in which it was a total social commitment that opened it, it both closed things off, but also opened things up to you. And the DSA, if you're for better or worse, if you're at a big local, can sort of kind of do that. Not not in the same way. We're still super alienated. And oh my God, did COVID fuck a lot of it up, I think, in ways that we do have to like deal with. Yeah. But um that's that's the problem but the the other thing that i think we're seeing is like the 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 pathologies and dysfunctions of the left that existed before the dsa now exist in the dsa like yeah like, like what my point about the caucuses is they're basically the same thing as the sectarian organizations fuck a lot of them used to be yeah, those oh, sectarian oh. organizations um, like absolutely and you know it used to be is just not that long ago and maybe still <laughs> like like you know like what is it bread and roses is basically like half of the leadership of salt and half of the leadership of iso in yeah. caucus together like yeah. it's it's like like that's not and, and and no one should be surprised about that either but it just means that like it's not it if that's the way you have to regionally organize is recapitulating the stuff that you had before. Like, I think there's a, I think there's a place for ideological tendencies in any broad based socialist organization. Like I do, I think we have to battle it out. I think the sectarian organizations would still exist if they're only for educational and, and like yeah. sorting functions. And I think that I actually think that in a healthy socialist organization, they would, what they would yeah. not be is the regional organizational chain. Like the only connection between the locals and the nationals, other than the convention, like, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, that's I a mean, problem. And, and, and it's a problem, and and you know, it's it's. Uh, I, I just what I I guess, if we're thinking about new forms of organizing and new like, you know, what I guess what you know, in, in some sense, what you want to see is like more opportunities to build that kind of organization and turn existing organizations into more like one socially integrated, but also politically participatory. Right. Like, um, 
so uh, you know one one of the things in this vein that I'm interested. I don't know if you ever have you ever gotten into the um, have you ever looked into the platform cooperativism world? Um, is that a I've heard familiar? It's like I'm not right? I, I, like you. We've gotten something I don't know much about, so I'm gonna let you leave. Well, you know, like uh, platform cooperatism is basically kind of the idea of uh, kind of organizations. Like if you think of a platform like the big tech platforms, Amazon or eBay or something like that, but cooperatively owned kind of internet based Mm -hmm. platform. So like, for example, in Montreal, there's a, there's a, a food delivery app called, I think it's called Radish that is owned mm-hmm. by the restaurants and the developers and the drivers and users collectively, right? Like it's, and it has, you know, it's pretty, it's expanding. It's pretty, you know, but creating that kind of thing. But there's also, pro, like, it's also exploring the process of turning organizations into collectively run, pro, you know, like existing, like, like, like turning either a, uh, like an like a startup type endeavor or an existing organization into something that's collectively run or collectively operated right um and collectively operated so or uh, owned right so that's kind of um i, I don't know what got me thinking of this but <laughs> that, that that's kind of the basic proposition right um so well, the one I mean, thing I would say, you, you made a point here that this would be helpful on uh, – we'll come back to this because, guys, of course, we're not going to deal with all the problems of labor and complexity theory and one discussion that just basically lays out the terms. Yeah. Um, but, for example, like I tell people that, like, okay, if you, we need a party and you want to jump to the party part, right? And I know we won't ever get what we want with the party, but the party needs – all kinds of social organizations beyond the party to maintain itself exist, draw from and collaborate with. And it always had them in the past. Uh, Like even, even like the CPUSA had the TUL, it had the CIO, it had the various front organizations, many of which I thought are stupid, but at least it had them. It had the civic functions, et cetera. We don't have any of that. Yeah. Like we have the unions that are depoliticized. If our, our, are more likely subordinate to a particular part of the Democratic Party. Um, I mean, why the fuck is Randy Weingartner in Ukraine otherwise? <laughs> like, like I, I can't, like, I bring that example up all the time, but my God. Like, I know. I know. Uh, but there's another, and you know, when my, when my, when my union active friends come back at me, they're like, yeah, but stuff is happening locally. And in some of these unions, they are. But I'm like, but that's not happening everywhere else. So can you, instead of telling me that there's this massive union movement that doesn't exist, can you tell me specifically what you're doing that's working so I can extrapolate from that in different contexts, figure what can be done in other areas and what can be. So one of the things that the guy who did, who did this to me on a show, I happen to know him, uh, we're even technically union brothers, uh, but very removed, like several state level organizations apart. Um, mm-hmm. their state level charter works completely different than ours. And I'm like, okay, but we can't even change ours legally. So <laughs> like there's things that you've done that like yeah. I cannot do, yeah. but look at what you did. So you in court, you, you, you pushed out administration from your union, which is in ours and got all staff, not just licensed staff in the union, in the same union. So like in Utah, for example, uh, the, the the NEA and the UEA run a licensed union and an unlicensed union. So staff, uh, teachers, and administrators. And look, I even think administrators should have a union. Like, I'm not even yeah. against that. They just should be in mine. Um, uh, and then staff are separate from us, which puts us at odds with staff because we can bargain oh, for no. ourselves and have staff over. And I'm like, so, like, that's something that needs to be fixed. Like, yeah, yeah, like uh, uh, that effectively makes us like a trade guild more than a yeah, more than uh, a, like a, I, a, an education union. And so, like, 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 what? How have other people dealt with that? And like, in places of, where they can legally, yeah, 
they have like contested their charters and rewritten them to include um more staff because in some ways it's it also makes bargaining easier like and protect yeah. like more i mean the bigger the, the the bigger the force you know the more power you have right i mean you know right just... and, and so like when they got rid of closed shop that union still has like 98 percent density in the in those schools right yeah. whereas like my union has like it's the strongest union in the Mountain West, and we only have like fifteen percent density in the schools. Wow! Like now, some other stuff is cultural. There's a history thing. There's there's like a lot of there, you know. But then there's stuff like we can't legally strike. Like, yeah. um, uh, we have it historically. The union has violated that before. But not anymore. The union also does a whole lot of um, diversity and inclusion initiatives that a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives that um, I think maybe put brown people in in hostile situations. Actually, but also like advocate for stuff like Abraham S. Kendi advocating for dropping anti discrimination clauses, but that automatically turns uh, the the queer and gender divergent part of the, the the contingent against the DEI initiative, because in this scenario that they were be more affected uh, at work because there's an active campaign um, right now. You mm-hmm. live oh, yeah, TikTok yeah, yeah. against yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. There's not an active campaign against people of color and there's just yeah. not that many people of color in Utah education. Uh, uh-huh. They're often, they often have to be exported from outside. Um, so, so it's like, well, that's, you know, and I'm, I'm not against diversity, but my, my, my answer was always like, well, if you get us paid more, there'll be a bigger incentive for first time college graduates to become teachers. Right. Like it yeah. wouldn't just be like the desperate and the noble Yeah. It, it, yeah. Like, or people, it, or, or people who, you know, obviously a huge part of that is like, like, you know, people marry within their class and like people often have like a, a higher earner spouse. And, right. Well, like, just want to say that's know. most of what my job is, is higher owner spouses. We have one member who is who is truly no blue shall bleach. They're from money and they do the job yeah. because they want a job. And then there's like me, who is one of the only people who is the primary breadwinner, who is also not from an upper class or even a, or even an upper middle class background. Like I don't come from money. And so like, and I'm an incredibly rare demographic there, but I'm more common than say the same kind of person. Plus they're also of color. Yeah. Like that's, that's a big ask. Like your parents busted your ass for you to get an education and you're going to become a fucking teacher. Like, (laughs) like, come on. I mean, that's, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a tragedy in itself, a cultural tragedy of America. But, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> but, but, it's but true. it also is like, like, it, like, so I'm like, if you fix this, demographics dictate that we will get more diverse. <laughs> like, like, fix the problem of us getting paid. And then, <laughs> and, 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 and like, yes, we do need more cultural inclusion stuff. Yeah. But do yeah. that first, and I think it'll be easier to do the other sale, whereas you're trying to do it now, and you're like, well, I mean, they literally at one point asked, uh, sent out a, an NEA uh, survey that made it sound like we could get either job protection or more diversity, but not both. Well, this, I, I mean, like, honestly, this this is just, re- this is very interesting to me just in terms of developing kind of like internal union organizing diversity like like really playing that out like you know like developing programs to play that dynamic out to explain it to people that diversity equity inclusion also includes financial it also includes like this very real like political economic analysis like racial analysis right that those things cannot be separated we can't just do one that we have to have a more uh, you know, a, a, a stronger, a stronger analysis to, to actually, if we're going to be serious about it, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that, I think that's really, I mean, I just, cause I talk to people who are doing these kind of things. So I'm, I'm, 
So like, what are know, the things or, that or I potentially so that like, I will tell you I actually have couple, I have a child that is screaming, so I gotta run in a, in a minute. Yeah, you but, we should uh, just end it here. The the one thing I was just gonna drop in for you something to play with. Yeah. What if we moved like what if we I don't like the way intersectionality has has become what it's become. Like I, I, I actually do think it's a problem. But I do think the initial impulse that Kimberly Crenshaw had to sectionally and now to analyze things. Oh, it's, it's totally right. Right. Like, 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 but I mean, um, I mean, it, but, but the law is not a uh, social ontology. Right. Right. Like, exactly. Like, so, and I, and, and, but now I'm like, but what if we took that impulse and did it not just for race and gender, but for every fucking thing we can think about, it's a meaningful difference in, in, like the in the not well off, not in the non elite sector yeah. of society. Like I mean, you look at sectional differences. We do real fucking sociology, then we can deal with the for itself. You know, are the collective depending on whether or not you want to use Hegelian or our our uh, otherwise logic. Um, here, because otherwise, I just feel like we're just like the working class become systemically something we can project upon but never actually understand even like it's like i feel yeah. like a whole lot of people just they the way they use the working class is the way like protestants use god it's just whatever they needed to be in any I, I, yeah no i completely agree. I, I i've had the, i've gone down this same road in, in my own thought like coming to kind of we like political world with a kind of like at least nascent like complexity background and being like like intersectionality like wanting to draw that out like you know in a more you know in a more robust way um and being a little frustrated by the kind of you know this isn't oppression poker but then it is (laughs) right right (laughs) but but yeah so no i i i think that i would i would i think that would be an interesting but maybe go. let's make our um, next topic so we can end this and you can go take care of your yeah. kids. Um, uh, let's make our next topic. What would it be like if we looked at intersectional? I'm only using that word in the analysis sense, not in the advocation of any ideology before people come at me. Um, yeah. Since what would a systemically complicated view of the way race, gender, and and class really interact in social reproduction what do we think it might look like let's make that in regards to labor let's make that our next episode okay thanks so much abby uh, thank you for dealing with me for two and a half hours oh no thank you it was very fun all right